It's that time of the week when former football and sports stars share their stories. It happens all right here, right now, on Thursday Night Tailgate. With your hosts, Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari. Guys, have some fun. Enjoy the guests. Take it away. Thank you, Joe. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us again tonight on Thursday Night Tailgate, your home for interviews and conversations with the greatest players in the history of the NFL and home of the NFL Alumni Association and the Gridiron Greats. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and tonight my co-host, Bob Lazari, and I, we have got a wonderful show in store for you. TNT is brought to you tonight by the great folks over at Kyvin Foods, Coastal Orthopedics, the Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory and the French Lick Resort. So we've got five great guests that we're looking forward to sharing with you. And first up tonight is going to be author Lisa Kelly. Lisa's written a couple of books titled The Men We Became, Echoes from the End Zone, and a sequel to that, More Echoes from the End Zone. And the book focuses on Notre Dame players and their lives after football and included amongst the players that she talks about in the book are former uh, quarterback uh, Terry Hanratty. You remember Terry, you know, former Steelers quarterback, also joined us a couple weeks back. Plus former Dolphins defensive back Sean Wooden, who has joined us a few times. So we'll hear a story about those guys and a whole lot more when Lisa joins us here about 15 minutes from now. At the bottom of the hour, former Patriots Pro Bowl running back Tony Collins is going to be with us for our five-star picks of the week. Following Tony, we'll get a return visit from former Broncos running back Olandis Gary. We'll kick off hour number two with uh, you know one of our you know really good friends that uh, we've had a, you know, a blessing to get to know over the last couple of years, and that's the dean of Atlanta Sports Talk Radio, Bo Bach. And then we'll round out the show with former Pirates World Series champion center fielder Omar Moreno. Omar, you'll remember, was part of the We Are Family Pirates. Back in 1979, when they won the World Series, unfortunately the last Pirates team to win a World Series, but very excited to get the opportunity to talk with Omar Moreno to round out the show. So we're going to have a lot of fun tonight, folks, so sit back, relax, let us take your mind off everything else going on in your life for the next couple of hours. Let's get started, though, by bringing in my co-host, Mr. Bob Lazari. Bob, how are you tonight, my friend? Hey, Chris, good evening. How are you? Oh, really well. Thank you, Bob. i tell you what, I can't be more excited about having Omar Moreno as part of the show. You know, being from Pittsburgh and growing up in the 70s, those Pirates teams were, were my absolute favorite. You've heard me talk about, you know, Willie Stargell, you know, being my baseball hero growing up. And, Bob, when, when I was 12 years old, my Aunt Tony, my mother's sister, wrote a letter to the Pirates about what a big fan I was and that, you know, my parents and I were going to be coming back up to Pittsburgh over the summer and how much I'd really like to meet, you know, Willie Stargell. And, you know, sort of long story short, I uh, I got the opportunity. You know, it worked. You know, they, the PR guy granted us the opportunity to go down into the Pirates' dugout during batting practice, and uh, and I got to meet Willie and Dave Parker and Omar Moreno and, and all the guys. And, the, boy, they couldn't have been nicer to a, a starstruck, you know, starstruck 12-year-old Bob, one of the best days of my life. So really excited about the opportunity to get to, to speak to Omar again now all these years later. Yeah, that's when, when you get a crossover guest like that, Chris, uh, baseball on a football show, you got to do it. I mean, he's, uh, it's just, it goes beyond football because guys like yourself and I, I don't care if we date ourselves tonight, Chris. The, we go back to those <laughs> days in the 70s, uh, Three River Stadium, Bob Prince, Manny Sangian, Al Oliver, who we've, spoken to uh moreno as i mentioned last week i thought he had come in second place in stolen bases one year with 96 that has to be a record chris when you think about it and i think uh, <laughs> i was looking into it today lafleur had one more that year to beat him but uh we'll, we'll right. talk about that but uh it, it, it's just great to have guys like him and uh, guys that we really grew up i mean we weren't little little kids but we were cutting our teeth on baseball big time and those pirate teams uh they scared you the way they can hit. They were scary. They still scare me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the, you know, back in the mid-70s, they called them the lumber company, right? It was a lumber company right. first. And then when Moreno and they had a, a, a shortstop, Frank Tavares, who came along, and both of those guys could steal a bunch of bases, so they became the lumber and lightning company, you know, yeah. for a time. But, uh, yeah, a lot of great players on those 70s Pirates teams, so very much looking forward to talking about that with Omar when uh, he joins us, like I say, about 90 minutes from now. 
So, Bob, let's go around the NFL a little bit. Let's talk about some of the things we learned from week six. And uh, we continue to see that the Jets just aren't very good, right? The play of quarterback Ryan Fitzpatrick in particular has been pretty poor. He's dead last in the league in completion percentage and quarterback rating and uh, five touchdowns to 11 interceptions. So now we learn the Jets are going to go back to Geno Smith. And I guess, Bob, the question is, is that a good move? Or would the Jets be better off finding out what they have? And they they got two other young quarterbacks on the roster as well, right? Bryce Petty and, and, and Christian Hackenberg. So would it be better for them to find out what either one or both of those guys have as opposed to going back to Geno Smith? No, Chris, you know, I, 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 you make a good point there. I mean, I think I've seen enough of Geno Smith. I mean, he's – it's not like we just saw a little bit out of this guy, unlike Landry Jones. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But, I mean, a guy like Geno Smith, uh, we had pretty much two full years of him and two part-time years of him. Uh, I think I've seen enough. This is a guy that's thrown 27 touchdown passes and has, I think, 10 more interceptions than that. Um, a very average quarterback. Now, you know, was it a good thing bringing Fitzpatrick back for the way we we can second guess this all day long, Chris? They're just not, just not a very good football team right now. I have a tendency that, like, maybe if you're going to do anything, you may uh, may interchange Fitzpatrick with some of these other guys. Kind of, you know, see what you have, see what chemistry works better than. What has uh, bringing Geno Smith back, Chris, it, it uh, kind of digs up a lot of stuff. Um, I know for, for a fact a lot of Jet fans were very kind of like, how shall we say, in good spirits when they kind of put that whole thing to rest. They had seen enough of Geno to um, a very decent, let's just call him a decent backup quarterback in the NFL. But to kind of hand him back the reins, uh, that's kind of making a statement that we're just a very, very average to below average franchise at this point, and uh, we've kind of given up on the season. Yeah, well, it certainly does say that. And uh, I just, you know, when you've got four quarterbacks, you know, on your roster, right, in your active roster, boy, you know, you would think that, you know, you'd give a shot to, to a Bryce Petty or a Christian Hackenberg because, you know, I, I just I can't believe, even if Geno goes out and does well, Right. I mean, what's the upside? Are are you going to stick with him? Is that going to be a guy, you know, Gino goes out and, and, and plays, you know, fairly well for, you know, the remainder of the season. Is that going to be your guy going forward? I mean, you got these two other young kids. I think you, to your point, Bob, I think you've seen enough of Gino to know what you're going to get from Gino. And yeah. you would think you would now, this season's over. You said it last week when we were talking about it. Season's over. Right, so it's time to see what you've got for the future. You would think you would. All right, let's see what Bryce Petty has. Maybe we go with him for a few games, see what he's got. You know, and if he takes off and has you know catches fire, great. Then maybe that's the guy for the next couple of years. But if he if he struggles, maybe you throw Christian Hackenberg in there and see what he's got. You got to plan for the future and get ready for it. Goodness knows, as a Steelers fan, you know we got we got nothing ready for the future with at the quarterback position. So you would think you know one of these guys will get an opportunity. It's going to be interesting to see. How it plays out from here, Bob. I just it just doesn't make as much sense to me to go with Gino. I agree, Chris. And again, this is a team, uh, the only team in the AFC that hasn't reached the hundred point plateau yet. That's pretty pathetic. And uh, he, again, Fitzpatrick, uh, you know, you're, you're, he's with a bad team too. I mean, I'm not going to lay all the blame on him. When you replace a quarterback, automatically he receives the blame. But I don't think you can say that in this case. But going back to a guy who basically put you in this situation. Uh, is not a good good idea, and I think most Jet fans feel that way right now. And Bob, I'm I'm I don't know about you, but I'm outraged that the league decided not to suspend Vontez Perfect after his latest antics. You know, of intentionally going after the knees of Patriots tight end Marcellus Martellus Bennett last weekend, and then stomping on the hand of Legarrette Blunt. It said they decided to decide to fine him seventy five thousand dollars. And in my opinion, Bob, really, this is a guy who should be tossed out of the league at a minimum. You would have thought the league would have suspended him for a number of games, maybe even the rest of the season. But, but no, for some reason, no, right? Let's, let's not forget, he was already suspended, right, for the first four games for his hit on Antonio Brown last year in the playoffs. He's clearly a guy who's incapable of learning a lesson 
from what happened. He's a dirty player. He's out to injure guys, that's for sure. I mean, you, you can't explain away the, the, the hit on, on Bennett. You know, oh, it was a good, you know, fake from uh, Tom Brady. He was just going after Bennett. Not that low. Not behind him in the knees. No, it's not. You know, I, I don't care what Marvin Lewis says. I don't care what the league says. You know, shame on you, Troy Vincent, for, for you know, handing out, you know, the, a, a, you know a fine versus a suspension, Bob. In my opinion, no room in the NFL for players like Perfect. Shame on the league for not making a bigger statement. Yeah, Chris, uh, I'm, right, I'm right with you here. This, is, it, this has gotten to a pathetic point, too. This is a guy, and uh, you and I have been sharing this. I mean, he's, this guy has been suspended in uh, – well, he's been fined eight times. Now, eight times already, Chris, for on-the-field incidents, um, close to 300 grand. Money means nothing to these guys. I mean, but – uh, this is eight times. We're not talking once or twice, Chris. Eight times on the field. Um, you got to think that number one, even in a violent game the way it is, this guy's a danger to other people because of uh, these. These are just horrific things he's doing on the field. I mean, what he almost did to Bennett, and uh, who knows what could have happened to Blunt, Chris. We can go on and on about the uh the result of his actions but number one the guy is not a nice guy number two uh this is like you had said who can stick up for him marvin lewis and him were in the league offices uh, this past winter chris uh, discussing his behavior and now we already have a couple incidents this year after he's seen the league officers i mean if this guy you're right if it's an outrage that they can't do anything more uh, or if they just choose not to, um, because maybe he happens to be a talented guy, which we know he is. But um, is there a place for guys like this in the NFL? I'm wondering on the, on the on the parts of teammates and other guys. I think they're even getting to the point where it's ridiculous, Chris. We were getting we're getting news that you know less people are watching some of these games because of behaviors like this, um, and we could talk all day about that. But. I'm with you. This guy is uh, hes a disgrace to good guys that we talk about all the time, the majority of good guys that are in this league, and uh, there is no excuse. I mean, what are they going to wait for, double figures and suspensions and fines? this is It's, it's gotten past a ridiculous point. Mm-hmm. And, Bob, my Steelers look like, you know, they're going to be without Ben Roethlisberger now for four to six weeks following a, a more extensive knee injury than they, than they first thought. They found some more damage in there from a knee injury he suffered last year against the Rams. So, Bob, if you're the Steelers' GM and you're facing the possibility of being without Ben and potentially till after Thanksgiving, do, do you roll the dice and you just stick with Landry Jones or, or maybe a Zach Mettenberger if, if Jones struggles you know, this coming weekend or for the first, you know, first couple of weeks, you know, they picked up Mettenberger at the end of training camp, you know, from the, from the Titans. So are, are, you, are you like the Vikings and you're calling around the league to see if you can pick up a veteran quarterback, whether it's, you know, hey, Fitzpatrick is, you know, out with the Jets. Maybe he could benefit from, you know, a change of scenery and a more high caliber offense, right? You get him, give him A.B., Antonio Brown, you give him Le'Veon Bell and the, and the other weapons that the Steelers has. Maybe that makes a, a short-term difference for a guy who would be a four- to six-week rental or, or maybe a Sean Hill who we talked an awful lot about with the Vikings. And, you know, either one of those guys you would think would be in a buy-low sort of scenario. So do you go that route, Bob, and make a few phone calls, or you just say, you know what, you know, Landry Jones last year was one-on-one, and the games that, you know, he relieved Ben in, you know, Mike Vick came in, he was also one-on-one, so they were two-and-two two in the four games Ben missed last year. So based on past history, you go, you know what, hey, if we end up two-and-two two out of this, we're six-and-four, and then we go into the rest of the season back with Ben, is that the route you go? Wow, this is a good question, Chris. Um, number one, as a preface to all this, and I'm sure you are uh, very concerned. I mean, we got Roethlisberger, I mean, his health. And, and didn't we say this at the beginning of the year? You know, we had picked uh, Steelers. And, of course, it was all about the right. ben, Big Ben stay healthy. That was always the asterisk. And, and it's happened to other teams who were highly touted, you know, um, that lost a, a big man. But to answer that question, Chris, you know, and we had talked about a guy like Ryan Fitzpatrick. If the Jets did what you said, maybe fool around with other com- kind of combinations and chemistry and everything, uh, Fitzpatrick with his experience and you put him on an already good team, 
um, that that's a different whole different scenario than Fitzpatrick continuing to play in New York. You know, then he becomes a, probably an A plus game manager instead of just a guy struggling with a bad team. Um, Landry Jones, Chris, I, I think you've seen enough. Well, I can't say he's, he hasn't played much, but that what we've seen. I mean, he's thrown. I think he's had a thirty completions, four picks. Um, they're a five hundred team, I think, with him. Uh, he's not going to win games by himself. Um, you know, if a guy like Blunt gets, uh, if he gets banged up a little bit, they're in really bad trouble. But um, that you could say that about any team. But uh, to answer that, Chris, you know, I might be looking on the waiver wire or trying to make a deal for at least a guy that's pretty proven, a la your Ryan Fitzpatrick's, who maybe can do a little bit better than for, and we're not we're not sure, Chris, uh, that big man. I know he's he's a stud and he wants to play all the time going to want to come back as soon as possible but um you know what's not to say that big ben comes back chris he's he's injury prone now we know that and so what 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 does december bring we don't know you've got to have a guy there we we talk about it all the time the importance of the quarterback position in this league i don't look at it just as a two two game bridge i look at it as you've got to have somebody in place the rest of the season that can learn the offense and do it well. So uh, I think I think you and I are on the same page. You keep your eye on that waiver wire. Get somebody in here who uh, who, who is a proven, decent quarterback that can lead this team to, uh, at least uh, in, in Ben's absence, uh, a better than 500 record. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good point you make, Bob, because it's not, it's not only maybe the, these four or six weeks but uh, if Ben comes back and gets injured again, you know, who do you do you go back to Landry Jones and a guy that you know just isn't you know isn't going to get you there? And maybe Orion Fitzpatrick could be good enough. Right? He almost got the Jets there last year. Maybe he's good enough uh, to be able to step back in again and uh, and keep the season going while uh, while Ben heals up. It'll be interesting to see if they do anything. My expectation is they do nothing. And uh, it's Landry Jones, and and away you go, and they just hope that Ben comes back and and uh, is okay. But uh, it would be interesting to see if they were to make a few calls around the league. Yep. All right, everyone, like we do every week here on Thursday Night Tailgate, we want to send out a big hello and an even bigger thank you to our military personnel who are listening in around the world on the Armed Forces Radio Network. We can't say thank you enough for doing what you do to protect all of us in our way of life. For everyone else listening on you know, the station or the application the app of your choice, we appreciate you so very much. We hope you'll join us in thanking the brave men and women serving in our military. If you happen to see one of our servicemen or women out in your daily life, wherever it is, grocery store, airport, restaurant, the bank, just out and about wherever you are, please stop for a moment and tell them thank you. They are our true heroes. We also want to thank our veterans for your service and your sacrifices over the years for us, your families as well, for all that you've been through for us as well. Big thank you to Sean Cruz and the wonderful folks over at the Armed Forces Radio Network. It is such an honor for Bob and I to have Thursday Night Tailgate as a part of your network. You can find our show by going to armedforcesradionetwork.org. And veterans, please continue to check out globalvoiceforveterans.org. What a great site with news and articles that you're going to find both interesting and beneficial for you. Again, globalvoiceforveterans.org. TNT is brought to you tonight by the great folks over at Kyven Foods, owned and operated by our good friend and former Bengals and Falcons tight end and Thursday Night Tailgate Hall of Famer, Reggie Kelly. Folks, if you want to be king of the grill, it's a must that you use Kyven Sweet Barbecue Sauce, ranked number 15 in the world by Barbecue Superstars. This barbecue sauce is a must for your big games, your tailgating needs. It's available at select Walmarts and Kroger's throughout the eastern half of the country. Four locations, online orders and recipes, check out their website at kyvan82.com. And Kyvan is spelled K-Y-V-A-N. And if your local Walmart doesn't carry the Kyvan Sweet Barbecue Sauce, we'll request it. I'm sure they'll be happy to add it to the shelves for you. TNT is also sponsored by Dr. Peter Candelora and the great folks over at Coastal Orthopedics. Folks, if you're an athlete or a weekend warrior dealing with injuries or discomfort, whether it's in your knees, your shoulders, your hips, your other joints, Don't just live with it. Do what athletes do to get relief, and that is contact Dr. Candelora. He can get you back to enjoying life. For more information or to schedule a consultation visit, go to athletesinjuries.com. Again, athleteinjuries.com. Baseball season, right? We're getting ready for the World Series. Just a couple of wins away for either, you know, well, you know, the Cubs, Dodgers, right? We already got the Indians there. If you love the game, you're going to love the Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory. They recently were welcomed into the TripAdvisor Certificate of Excellence Hall of Fame. 
the museum, very cool for everybody in the family because you get to walk their live production line, see the, ba- the bats being manufactured right there in front of you. A couple of weeks back, right, you had uh, the executive director, Ann Jewell, right here with us on Thursday Night Tailgate talking about the Ripley's Believe It or Not exhibit, which has some, you know, kind of bizarre baseball treasures there. And like I say every week here on the show, folks, don't miss the Bat Vault where you can hold actual game-used bats from so many of the game's greatest legends. You get Hank Aaron's bat in there, Ted Williams, my hero Willie Stargell, right, his bat's in there. To find out more information about the museum and to book your visit, go to sluggermuseum.com. And please, folks, Go check out our good friends up at the French Lick Resort. You want to talk about a fantastic place to both stay and play golf or simply relax and enjoy yourself. Well, you're not going to find a better place than the French Lick Resort. It is a wonderful setting. Two championship golf course, golf course designs up there, one from Pete Dye, the other from Donald Ross. The Pete Dye course hosted last season's Senior PGA Championship. They recently hosted the LPGA Legends Championship as well. The Donald Ross design course was the site of Walter Hagen's PGA championship victory back in 1924 they got a great spa on site and a casino right there on the property as well my friends to find out more information and to book your stay go to frenchlick.com all right now joining us on the kyvin foods guest line is author lisa kelly lisa's written a couple of books uh, titled echoes from the end zone the men we became and a sequel titled more echoes from the end zone. The stories and the players that she talks about in both books are some of the legendary players from the history of Notre Dame and the, you know, the men that they really became after their playing days, including two guys we've had here on the show, right? We talked at the top of the show, former Steelers quarterback Terry Hanready, who joined us a few weeks ago, and former Dolphins defensive back Sean Wooden, who's been with us a couple of times here on TNT. The book, it's a five-star rated. Go to Amazon.com, look it up, five-star rated book, and we're very excited that Lisa is here with us tonight on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Lisa, Chris and Bob here. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Lisa. Thank you for having me on the show. So, Lisa, I I love your bio, which says you sort of had no choice but to love Notre Dame. Your father was a part of the Notre Dame class of 1965. You learned your first off-color word when you were three years old, watching the Notre Dame-USC game on Thanksgiving at your grandparents' house. So talk about how did this whole thing get started for you? Yes, that's that's the truth there. My my dad was a Notre Dame grad, and from as far along as I can remember, we've always watched Notre Dame football. Um, I grew up in Southern California, so saw a lot of USC Notre Dame games and when it came time to apply for college, you know, Notre Dame was kind of my destiny. So it was great. I my senior year was the national championship in 1988, so I couldn't have been more blessed to go in there as a freshman and have a number 1 football team. So I don't think I realized how lucky I was till many years later, but um, I couldn't have been more fortunate to see the football that I saw when I was there. So was there, was there no question you were going to Notre Dame, like it or not, you're going to Notre Dame to follow in your father's footsteps? My dad was actually really great. He told me I could go wherever I wanted to go, and he made sure that it was my choice. So growing up in California, I applied to – two California schools and then I applied to eight schools all over the country and when I got my acceptance letters back I got into the eight schools elsewhere in the country and neither of the schools in California so at that point I knew I wasn't staying at home so it was like what was the best fit for me Um, ironically I got my last acceptance letter on April Fool's Day and that was Notre Dame (laughs) So uh, my mom had to physically open it in front of me because I thought she was pranking me. And once I saw that golden dome on the letterhead, I was that was it. That was where I went. So, and Lisa, I also read about the Big East Biggest Fan Contest that you won a few years back. So the question is, you know, how, do, how does a big Notre Dame football fan convince people that you're the biggest Big East college basketball fan? Yeah, this is a pretty cool story. I was reached out to on Twitter. Um, They were doing this contest for biggest fan of the Big East Conference, and they were selecting one blogger to represent every school in the conference. So they reached out to me. Do you want to represent Notre Dame? Sure. You know, 
I'm not a huge basketball fan, but, you know, why not? So they flew us to New York for media day. We got to interview coaches and players, and every two weeks we had a writing assignment, and off I went, you know, and all of these people I'm competing with are huge Big East basketball fans, and we had assignments like create your dream Big East basketball team, and I don't know anything about Big East basketball, so there was a lot of time spent on Google, and uh, at the end of the day, my hard work paid off uh, on center court at Madison Square Gardens. I was crowned wow. biggest fan and got the keys to my brand new Volvo, so not too bad. Wow. That is a cool story. Yeah. Bob, questions for Lisa? Yeah, Lisa, it's great to have you. And um, I want to talk about your own educational experience at Notre Dame. We know we've talked to so many guys from either Ivy League schools and Stanford and Notre Dame, and, and, and it actually we actually bring up academics a lot. In a, in a world, as you know, that goes crazy with big-time football, and it could be a lot besides athletics that comes into play at some of these so-called football factories. Your own, as far as your own experience, your own education, tell us, uh, you know, did you go there with uh, a certain major in mind, and, and how was the educational experience for you while you were there? I did. I actually, growing up in Southern California, um, the town that I lived in was Simi Valley, and we had rocket dying there, and they tested all of the rocket engines um, for the space program. So when I went to Notre Dame, I was intent on being an aeronautical engineer. I wanted to work for NASA someday, had these lofty goals of being an astronaut. Get to Notre Dame, first semester, I had 18 credit hours. So I had chem, calc, physics, English, history, you know, I had a pretty good load. And in my first chemistry class, they told us, look left, look right. At the end of this year, one of you will be gone. One third of the engineering students drop out after the first year and become business majors. And that was me. I did one year of aeronautical engineering and graduated with a degree in marketing. So not my plan at all, but, you know, engineering wasn't in the cards for me. And I love what I do today. So I feel like everything happens for a reason. And while you were there, Lisa, you know, we, we, you know, we, I, reading your bio, uh, I, I read that your first interview, as far as the book, was with the former tight end McBride. Uh, other, while you were at the school, did you uh, have a chance to run into a lot of the football players, spend time with them, uh, become friendly with them? Tell us about your interactions with athletes while you were there. Absolutely, I know. Um, as a business major, there was a lot of football players who were studying, you know, marketing and finance and accounting. And um, in my graduating class, 13 of my marketing classmates ended up going pro that year. So it was great. You turn on the TV and there's Rick Meyer and, you know, a few short weeks before he was sitting next to the class and me, with me. So um, I really did get to know a lot of the guys um, it's not a huge school, you know, people think Notre Dame is such a big school, but really my class had 1,800 kids, which is really not big when you're talking about a Michigan or, you know, Ohio State who has these huge classes. So you did get a good chance to get to know a lot of the athletes and, you know, 20 plus years later, we're all still really good friends. So it was great. Lisa, like I mentioned in your intro, you wrote you wrote about two players that we've had on this show, former Steelers quarterback Terry Hanratty and former Dolphins defensive back Sean Wooden. Let's talk about Terry Hanratty first. He helped lead the Irish to a national championship back in 1966. Take us through what you learned about Terry. I love Terry. He's hysterical. He's probably one of the funniest guys that I've interviewed and a couple of weeks ago, I got to actually meet him in person. We golfed at a golf tournament. And just seeing him with those 1966 classmates of his, they're still super tight. They have a great rapport. They're still playing jokes on each other. And the thing with Terry was uh, uh, quite a few of the stories that he told me were things that mm, may not have been repeatable, but 
He's funny. <laughs> he enjoys life. He lives to the fullest. You know, he talked about some of the pranks that he pulled on his teammates at the Steelers and and he got away with it, which is the best thing of all. You know, the next day he'd go in and pull a prank on somebody else and they never seem to learn. You know, he's like, seriously, I did this yesterday and you fell for it and you fell for it again today. So I, I really enjoyed, you know, hearing his stories about his experiences at Notre Dame and, you know, how the coaching staff really – develop them on the field and what those skills then translated to, you know, in the classroom. He, uh, he went on to work in the finance world. And, you know, when you're a quarterback, you have to think very quickly on your feet. And when you're working somewhere like the stock exchange, you have to think very quickly on your feet. So I feel like his years of playing football really served him well, not only on the field, but in the rest of his life as well. What about Sean Wooden? What would you learn about Sean? I actually knew Sean in college. He was a couple years younger than me, but, you know, I knew him a little bit in college. And he's just such a great person. He's, he was a good teammate. You know, he's a great family man. You know, I couldn't say enough about him. He really helped me kind of get this book project off the ground. You know, when I kind of started pitching the idea, Sean was one of my biggest supporters and would tell me, all right, who do you want to meet? You know, who, who can I make a connection, you know, with for you to interview? And um, I, I really, it was great. I didn't expect the support that I received from the guys. I mean, I knew we all had that Notre Dame connection, but I never expected them to do as much for me as far as introducing me to other players supporting me on the book tour. I mean, if I picked up the phone and asked somebody for a favor, they were ready to help. So, you know, the they always talk about, you know, the Notre Dame network and, and the Notre Dame family, and I totally saw it in action with this group of guys. So I feel very blessed, you know, and I feel like I told their stories well, and so in return they helped me back. You know, I'm not – not some hard-nosed reporter trying to get a scoop. I'm trying to tell their stories in the best way possible to not only, you know, benefit me, but to benefit them as well. And so it's been, it's been quite an experience. Bob, one more for Lisa before we let her go. Yeah, Lisa, and I've been uh, looking at some of the, the news and events on the site and uh, you've done an awful lot of book signings and there's an awful <laughs> lot of weekends and, and uh, it must be, be a great feeling and you, when you when you could combine your marketing background and your uh, of course your writing and interviewing abilities and uh, it must ha- be a, a feeling next to very few to have the feeling that people buy your book and actually want it signed uh, those must be very special times when you're able to get out and do that it's awesome i i really enjoy you know the travel is hard i have a teenager and a 20 something that I'm trying to raise and a full-time job. And then I'm gone pretty much every other weekend, but it's awesome to get out and talk to people and, and hear their favorite stories about their favorite players, which kind of excites me about who I want to interview next, because I definitely want to continue writing. And I think, you know, I've, interviewed about 60 football players at this point and so I'm ready to kind of embark on my next journey which is a couple basketball stories a couple hockey stories you know baseball I want to get some women's stories involved because I feel like there's so many great success stories about student athletes you know that need to be told so that the upcoming kids can read what happens when you work hard and get a good education? You know, you don't only succeed on the field or on the court, but you succeed in life as well. Lisa, let our listeners know where they can get a copy of the books and then how they can follow you over social media as well. Great. Um, You can get the book on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. And if you're interested in a signed copy, if you go to my website, which is 
themenwebecamend.com. Um, I have links there that can take you to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and directly to me to get a signed copy. I'm offering free shipping in the month of October, so take advantage of that. Um, on social media, my Twitter handle is the number four Leaf Clover Girl, and you can catch me on Facebook also at The Men We Became ND. That's great. Lisa, thank you so much for taking time out of your night to be a part of the show. When, uh, when you get the next stories put together, we hope you'll come back and, and share those with us as well. We'd love to have you as part of the show again sometime. Sounds great. I'd love that. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Take care, Lisa. All the best to you and your family. Thanks. That is author Lisa Kelly. Again, the books are Echoes from the End Zone, The Men We Became, and More Echoes from the End Zone. So great stuff, great story. She, she did, you know, to her credit, you know, she captured them very well. I got a copy book and, uh, and took a look at it. You know, she captured really some really good stuff in there from uh, from Terry Hanratty. And we know, Bob, you know, some of the pranks that Terry, you know, shared with us about what he did Jack Lambert and, and those sorts of things. But uh, really great stuff from uh, from Lisa Kelly. Yeah, and uh, what you said about Hanratty, Chris, that some of it's uh, unprintable and whatever, that, that's uh, believable. As you and I uh, <laughs> talked to him, he's a, he's a kind of right. uh, no-nonsense guy. I'll tell you what he thinks. But, uh, yeah, Lisa's great. I mean, uh, to have that Notre Dame you talk about. I, I have a feeling, Chris, uh, you know, she said she had a lot of choices, but I think she was scared to go to Notre Dame. What do you think? I mean, there's <laughs> a, a lot of family uh, stuff going on there, so. Uh, great. We'll speak with her again. All right. We've got our next guest, Tony Collins, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Tony on the other side of this station identification. This is Christine Lisi, and you're listening to Thursday Night Tailgate, where NFL stars go to tell their stories with Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari on the Armed Forces Radio Network. And now back with us on the Kyvin Foods guest line is former Patriots Pro Bowl running back Tony Collins to go through our five-star picks of the week. Hey, Tony, how are you tonight, my friend? Hi, Tony. I am doing fantastic. How are you doing, Chris and Bob? All right. Ah, really well. Thank you, Tony. So, am, Tony, am, last am week I, it's uh, sort, of a, sort of a push. Am, am I winning? Am I winning? <laughs> yeah, I know that's all you care about. We, we all finished three and two. Last week, so uh, no blood last week. Uh, we all uh, it, we all incorrectly picked the Broncos over the Chargers, so we were wrong on that one. We all had the Patriots over the Bengals and the Giants over the Ravens. Bob and I were right uh, with the Seahawks over the Falcons, and uh, you had, you had gone with Atlanta, but you bested us with the Cowboys over the Packers. So three and two across the board for the season. That leaves you and I tied still at sixteen and nine. Bob at fourteen and eleven. So. Still very early, a lot of games to go. Oh, yeah. So, let, let's get into this week, Tony. Um, we'll start off with the 2-3 and three Saints going to the 3-2 and two Chiefs. The Chiefs are a seven-point home favorite. The over-under is 50-and-a-half. Tony, can the Chiefs slow down the Saints' offense, which is averaging 31 points a game, by the way? Can they, can they slow them down enough to get a win? I'll tell you what, man. It, it's, it's tough to go into Kansas City and win a game, but – the way the way uh, New Orleans is playing right now, I mean, their offense is just incredible to me. Uh, I I I want to, I really want to pick New Orleans to win, but I, I just it's just Kansas City. Something about their that home crowd, man, and that defense, and and I, oh man, I I I'm, I think I'm gonna go with Kansas City to, to pull this one out going to be a close one, 37 to 35, Kansas City, home crowd. All right. Bob, what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, I think Tony's on to something there, Chris. I, I, uh, as good as Breeze has been and how he continues to age like a good wine, he, uh, you know, the Kansas City, Kansas City doesn't light it up as far as offensively too much, but they do. Mm-hmm. They'll play some good defense, and um, you know they've let they've yet to lose at home, and we know what that crowd in Kansas City's like. Uh, I think they can slow down Breeze enough this week, and uh, win. I think it'll be a close one, and like Tony says, I think you might see some points scored. I, I'm I'm going to say, how about 30-28 Kansas City? Close game. All right. 
you know, guys, as you mentioned, Bob, Chiefs defense, really good, ranked sixth overall, but 12th against the pass, and surprisingly, 31st in sacks. They only have seven sacks this year. And so, I mean, on the upside, they're tied with Arizona for the league lead in interceptions with nine. So I'm with you guys. I think it's going to be an intriguing matchup against Drew Brees and that Saints offense that's, you know, averaging 335 passing yards per game, guys. Brandon Cook having a nice year for the, for the Saints, averaging 17 yards a catch. The downfall for the Saints continues to be their defense, dead last, allowing an average of 34 points a game, guys. So the only question to me is, can Alex Smith and the Chiefs offense that's averaging 22 points a game take advantage of a, you know, of a bad Saints defense? Can they, is, can they win a track meet? Can they turn it into one? And I don't know if they've got enough, Bob, to your point. I'm not sure Kansas City's offense has enough weapons to really stay up with it, you know. So uh, I'm, I'm going the opposite way, guys. I'm going to take an upset here. I'm going Saints. I think we're right around the same scores as you guys. I got the Saints 34-30, so I'm going to take the upset in that one. Our second game this week, fellas, 5-0 uh, Minnesota Vikings going to the 3-2 and two Philadelphia Eagles. The Vikings are a two-and-a-half point road favorite here, and the over-under is 39-and-a-half. So, Tony, can the Vikings keep it going and remain undefeated? I think they can. I really do. You know, the, what's the quarterback for, 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 the, for the Vikings right now? I can't think of his name. Sam Bradford? Brad Bradford. Bradford. You know, for, you know, him leaving Philly and going back there and playing, you know he's going to be He's going to be ready for that game. He's going to. I think he's going to. He's going to it's going to be lights out for for that. Minnesota defense is tough. Uh, Philly right now. Um, you know they're 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 you know they're struggling a little bit. And so I'm I'm going to go with Minnesota to win this one, 27 to 20. All right, 27 to 20. Bob, what do you think? Should be a good one, guys. Uh, uh, arguably two of the best defenses in football um, could be an ugly game in, in that in that respect uh, but um, I think I'm going to go with Tony I think Minnesota the way they're playing defense and you know uh, against the young quarterback Chris they'll, they'll come in here and throw some things uh, out there um, yeah I, I, you know it's, it's hard to pick against a team but a road favorite I think they weren't it in this spot i'm going to say minnesota kind of an ugly game how about 2017 minnesota all right well guys you know i love carson wentz and what he has done so far this year the eighth rated passer in the league carson wentz completing 65 percent of his passes seven touchdowns the only one pick having said that you know you guys hear me say this all the time bob particularly you defense wins championships right and the vikings defense Number one, they're allowing a league low 12.6 points per game. They're allowing under 78 yards rushing per game. They're third in the league in sacks with 19. They're number one in the giveaway takeaway ratio at a plus 11. I just, you know, I'm with you guys. I think there's just too much to like about their defense. And, and Tony, to your point, Sam Bradford coming home, probably a little chip on his shoulder, you know, coming back to Philly with, uh, you know, a couple of nice weapons that he has in Stephon Diggs and Kyle Rudolph. You know, I think they're doing a lot to on the offensive side, enough to win games. So I'm with you guys. I'm taking the Vikings. I've got a 27-17. to 17. Our third game this week, the 4-1 and one Seahawks go to the 3-3 three and three Cardinals. The Cardinals are a one-point uh, home favorite, the over-under 43-and-a-half. So, Tony, Seahawks have won three in a row, got kind of lucky last week, you know, at home uh, with a controversial call, but uh, one against Atlanta. The Cardinals have won two in a row. Now that Carson Palmer is back at quarterback. So which one of these two teams remains hot after this week, Tony? Uh, this is a tough one, man. You know, Seattle, you know, they can play well, uh, offensively play well sometimes, and then they they can't even score points. Uh, man, playing in, playing in Arizona – Man, I tell you what, man, I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to go with the Cardinals on this one. I, I just think the Cardinals' defense is going to come, uh, rise to the occasion, and Cardinals beat them. Clo- uh, close game, low-scoring game, 17-13 Cardinals. All right. Bob, what do you think? Yeah, Tony, this is our coin flip of the week. I'm going to go <laughs> – just because you said the card, I just I'm going to flip the coin here. I'm going to say Seattle. I mean, their, their defense is still very good. Like I said, like Chris said, they kind of struggled last week. I think they play a little better here. It's tough going against my Super Bowl pick, Chris, 
but uh, they've already disappointed me enough this year where I, I feel comfortable in doing that. So I know Kyle Palmer's back, but Seattle, uh, they're looking pretty good. I, I'm going to say Seattle goes in there, very physical game. Uh, Seattle wins 24-17. Now, you know, one of the things that surprised me last week about Seattle was, you know, how how well, you know, Julio Jones, he boy, he seemed to own Richard Sherman last week. Huge surprise. Seven catches, 139 yards, and a touchdown. And, you know, Sherman should have been called for a pass interference near the end of that game for grabbing Julio Jones' arm. But, you know, maybe this week, you know, Larry, Larry Fitzgerald might be a little more Sherman speed these days, so it'll be interesting to see how that matchup goes on Sunday. The Cardinals defense playing pretty well, guys. Fourth overall, six in points allowed. Now we know how good Seattle's defense is, right? Number one overall, second in points allowed. So I think you guys are right. I think this is going to be a defensive struggle. I think it's going to be a really close game. I like what Arizona's running back David Johnson is doing, third in the league in rushing yards, tops in rushing touchdowns. So, you know, I think, I think Arizona figures out a way to get it done at home. I'm, I'm with you guys on the close score. I like the Cardinals. I'm going to go with the Cardinals here 20-17. to 17. All right, we've got two more games to pick, then we're going to get to our next guest, Olandis Gary. Tony, uh, our fourth game this week is the 4-2 and two Texans going to the 4-2 and two Broncos. The Broncos are an amazing nine-point home favorite in this one. Surprises me that many points. Over-under is 40-and-a-half. So, Tony, can Brock Osweiler talk about you know, quarterbacks going back you know, to haunt their old teams? Can Osweiler go back to Denver and make them regret letting him go? Not this week. Mm-hmm. No, not this week. I, I just think Denver is going to be just a little bit too much uh, for them. Uh, you know, Denver Denver's defense, you know, playing in my house, Mile High Stadium, they're going to be up for the game. Uh, really, they need to win this week as well. Uh, so, going with Denver, and this is the one. It's going to be a blowout, 37-7. Oh! To 7. Denver. <laughs> what do you got? What was the score? 37-7. to 7. Denver. 37 to 7 and the Tony Collins blowout special of the week. Bob, what do you think? I like Denver too, guys. Uh it's amazing to me a Houston's 4 and 2 and they've given up more points than they've scored. Um they're good at home, they're not good on the road. I think they go into the mile high air. They have a problem there. I, I, again, Denver's defense and Denver can score more points. It's just it's not a good matchup for Houston. I I, I say I, I I think it won't be as – yeah, I'm a Tony. I'm not going to say a big, big blowout, but I like Denver to win this game. How about 30 to 30 and 14? 30 to 14, all right. So, guys, you know, obviously we know, right, Texans are without J.J. Watt, but the defense, guys, remain seventh overall. They're second against the pass. Now, vulnerable against the run, they're allowing 126 yards rushing per game. So C.J. Anderson and or Devontae Booker could have nice games this week for those fantasy football players out there. You, you certainly want to probably get one of those guys in your lineup. The Broncos, right, they've, now they've lost two in a row. Their defense uncharacteristically allowed, you know, over 20 points in both of those games. Trevor Simeon back last week for the Broncos. Played okay. He was 30 of 50 for 230 yards and a touchdown. I wouldn't expect more yards or touchdowns from him than that this week either. But I expect Denver to, you know, try to grind it out on the ground, they'll do that more this week, you know. And really, I think, you know, they're going to want to come after Osweiler to show him he should have never left. So I'm with you guys. I like Denver. I think it's going to be closer than what you guys have. But I got Denver 24 to 20, eking out a win, staying, uh, staying, you know, getting, I guess I should say, getting a win up in mile high. So Denver, I got. So all three of us go with Denver there. And our last game this week, fellas, you know, um, is Tony's 5-1 <laughs> and one Patriots going to my pitiful 4-2 and two Steelers. Who are going to be without Ben Roethlisberger for, you know, like we say, the foreseeable future, four to six weeks. The Patriots are only an eight-point road favorite. The over-under is 47.5, and, and that may be just what the Patriots score by themselves against what's turning out to be a really awful Steelers defense. So, Tony, if my Steelers win this game, and you've had to go through some embarrassment on Facebook because of the Buffalo Bills game, if my Steelers pull off this miracle – I want, I want, you know, for you know, every day next week, I, I want to hear how, you know, how you, how much you love the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, uh, okay, so, so, so if New England wins, you're gonna have to put it on your face how much you love the New England Pages. Is that correct? <laughs> no, I'm prohibitive <laughs> underdogs here. It's, it's like it would be like the USA beating the Soviet Union. It's, it's the miracle on turf if the Steelers were to pull this game off. Your team, man. 
Well, what, what, it's your team with Ben and without Ben, right? Uh, I mean, I, I mean I, I'm not telling you. I'm turning code on my boys now. <laughs> I'm just telling you they got no shot to win this game. So. <laughs> Let me tell you, man. Anyway, what do you think, Tony? What's what's the you, final you score got, here? You, you, you guys got some great receivers, man. But the only problem is for this week, you don't got Ben throwing the ball to him. That's going to be your only problem. Right. Now, Landry's a, Landry's a decent quarterback. But, uh, you know, Belichick's going to come up with some schemes that's going to throw Landry off a little bit. So, uh, he, he's not Big Ben. Uh, Big Ben can, you know, throw two or three people off of him and still, still throw the ball downfield. That's not going to happen this week. Uh, Brady's playing well. The uh, New England defense is playing well. So we're going to go in there. It's, it, it's, it's tough going into Pittsburgh to win, but uh, the, the 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 odds are, are with us because Ben is not playing. Uh, you guys got tons of weapons on offense, so I I, I got to give you that. But again, missing Ben is going to be a tough one for you guys to pull this one off. So uh, you know you know I'm going with my Patriots with Ben or without Ben. I was going to go with the Patriots, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, it, 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 it's. Not, I don't think it's going to be a blow. You know, it's, it's going to be tough going in there. You know, the, the, going to, going into Pittsburgh playing, but we we will win, twenty seven to fourteen. All right, I'm surprised. I figured this was going to be a Tony Collins blowout special for sure. <laughs> Bob, what do you think? I like the Patriots too, Chris. Um, they uh, they haven't lost on the road yet, and I, I don't believe they're going to lose in Pittsburgh. They um, again, Gronkowski. Nobody can defend him. Like you, you are you're critical of the defense, Chris. They, there's nobody that can defend him, especially near the goal right. line. Uh, he'll probably catch a couple of touchdown passes himself. Uh, with Brady back, and, and now he's more comfortable, and they're they're just well balanced. And then. Uh, Picture a Belichick uh, coach team going against a, a quarterback with very, like little experience. I mean, this is. I think it's going to be. It's not going to be pretty for Pittsburgh. How about thirty-one, thirty-one, seventeen, New England? All right. Well, you know, and I, I, you know, this is the first time I, I, I got to pick against my boys. You know, the Steelers were thirtieth no, in the don't league. Do it, Chris, don't last, do it. Don't I, do I got it. to. I mean, you know, I mean, I can't. You, you, you can't just be silly. And, and say the Steelers are going to win this game. They're they're thirtieth in the league against the pass last year. The thirtieth against the you know pass again this year. You're bringing Tom Brady and DeBoss Point Gronk in here and all that. The, the Steelers defensive backs are, are 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 bad. Their outside linebackers may be the worst in Steelers history. You got Cam Hayward out. Ryan Shazier can't stay healthy for more than a couple of games a year. Jarvis Jones is 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 you know ridiculously bad as a as a pass rusher. He's okay against the run. They, they just they get no pressure on the quarter backs this year so and you know obviously we know Ben's out so then it's really all you need to know I mean Tom Brady and LeGarrette Blunt you know LeGarrette Blunt's going to want to rub it in the Steelers nose talk about another guy coming back to a former you know play against a former team so I I got this as a as a Tony Collins blowout special I say the Patriots win this game 45 to 10. Tony before we let you go remind our listeners of all about (laughs) about all the great things you're doing to help kids get to college. TonyCollinsFoundation.com, TonyCollinsProjects.com, man. We're helping kids get into school. Go on the website, make a donation, uh, get a book from TonyCollinsProjects.com. Every book that we sell go towards helping the kids uh, into college. There you go. Tony, thank you so much for uh, being a part of the show again this week. We look forward to catching up with you again next week. We'll see how we did. Yes, sir. Good luck, Tony. Take care, Tony. All the best to you and your family, my friend. You Take too. care. All right, we've got our next guest, Orlandis Gary, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Orlandis on the other side of these words from our friends up at the French Lick Resort. This is the time to play legendary golf at French Lick Resort. Book one of our money-saving packages like the Hall of Fame package and play our Pete Dye and Donald Ross courses. Stay in historic luxury at our French Lick or West Baden Springs hotels. Relax in our spas. Dine in our restaurants. Have some gaming fun in the casino. Or just rock on our rambling verandas like they did 100 years ago. Go online to FrenchLick.com and book your legendary golf getaway now at French Lick Resort. Hello, everybody. Van or all right here reminding you that you're listening to Thursday Night Tailgate with the dynamic duo of Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari, right here on the Armed Forces Radio Network. And now back in making his fourth appearance with us on the Kyvin Foods guest line is Orlandis Gary. Let me, let me remind you about Orlandis's background. He is from Washington, D.C., played his first 
Uh, first couple of years of college ball up at Marshall before transferring to the University of Georgia to play his final two seasons. And over those two seasons at Georgia, he rushed for nearly 1,100 yards and 17 touchdowns. So 17 touchdowns put him in the top five in the SEC both seasons. He was a fourth-round draft pick by the Denver Broncos in 1999, and he burst onto the scene his rookie year when he replaced and injured Terrell Davis and rushed for nearly 1,200 yards and seven touchdowns. He played in the NFL from 1999 to 2003 with the Broncos and the Lions, and over that time he averaged four yards a carry and seven yards per reception. In 1999, he was the Week 15 Offensive Player of the Week, and we're excited to have him back with us again tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Orlando's Chris and Bob, thanks for coming back on the show. Welcome back. Hey, fellas, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, man, I need to uh, have you guys open up for me more often. That was great, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. Anytime. So, Orlando, I wanted to start our time with you tonight by getting your thoughts on your alma mater, the University of Georgia. They had some high expectations coming into this season with changing coaches and bringing back your former teammate, Kirby Smart, now as the head coach. Things haven't gone exactly According to plan, and the last last Saturday had to be or last Saturday had to be tough for you with with uh, a loss to Vandy that had to sting. But give us your assessment. What it, what do you think about what you've seen so far from your Bulldogs? Um, um, you know, I just think it's it's, it's growing pains, right? I mean, anytime you you get a, get into a new situation, you know, guys uh, still learning each other, you know, filling each other out as far as coaching staff and players and things like that. Then you know you have a, a freshman quarterback, Eason, that that's out there. Um, you know, so he's getting adjusted to things as well. So, um, to me, you know, I, I just think teams about to get us now because uh, in a couple of years, I don't think they'll be able to stop us. So, um, to answer your question, I, you know, I love Kirby. Like you said, I played with him. You know, I, I took the field with him uh, on a, on many of occasions. So he's definitely my guy, and I, I definitely, I mean, I think it was long overdue for him to get that job there, at Georgia. You know, Landis, you know, I mean, Georgia is, 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 you know, one of the great running back colleges, you know, programs in the, you know, in the history of the game. So many great running backs like yourself have come out of, come out of UGA. You got another one there now and Nick Chubb got off to an incredible start, rushed for 222 yards against North Carolina in the first game. He's been dealing with some, some injuries lately, got a high ankle sprain so far this season. But, you know, is, is Nick Chubb the next great UGA running back that we're going to be seeing in the NFL for many years? Um, I think so, and you know they got Sony as well, and and you know so so there's there's a couple couple uh, guys there right now that, that is going in. Uh, you know, Vander Holyfield uh, is is there as well. So I mean, you, you know, like you said, there's always a stable there. But um, I definitely think that uh, you know we have to get back to basics and, and start to run the ball. You know, with those horses that we have in the backfield. Bob, questions for Orlandis? Well, Landis, it's great to speak with you again. How you been? Uh, I'm well, Bob. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. That's good to hear. And, and uh, you know, Chris had mentioned you, when uh, guys like Terrell Davis, you know, and and uh, you got your opportunity, Landis, uh, when Davis was there, and he would go on to play a few more games, and, and sadly uh, just was never the same running back. But, uh, man, we remember him as a very tough, physical just a very good guy, good runner. Uh, what did you learn from just being around him before you got your chance? Oh man, I, I'll go a little, a little um, earlier. I'll go. I'll take it back to my my senior year in, in at Georgia, and mm-hmm. uh, Terrell. He came to our, our G Day game, and and you talking about somebody that was in awe. You know, I was out there. You know, with, with my hero. Um, and he actually went out with us that night as well. So, you know, it, it, I think he, he, to me, he he put a humanistic perspective, you know, to to um, NFL guys, NFL players, and um, you know, he brought uh, Byron Chamberlain with him. He was a tight end. He played tight end at at uh, Denver with Terrell and at uh, Minnesota with the Vikings as well. And and so, you know, when when all the seniors are uh, in the locker rooms talking about, you know, what place would you want to play at and things like that, right? So I always told the guys that I I wanted to play for Denver. I wanted to go to Denver to play behind Terrell Davis and, you know, just to to, to be his understudy. And, um, you you know, so so, um, you know the story about that. You know, know, I got drafted in the fourth round um, by the Broncos. And, you know, with with me and Terrell – 
having uh, you know a similar story. Him coming from California, me coming from the D.C. area, and you know probably ninety ninety five percent of the guys that play at the University of Georgia are from either the state of Georgia or Florida or, you know, somewhere in, in, in the deep south. So, you know, with us having that background. So we always, you know, um, took to each other. And, uh, you know, that year that he got hurt in the fourth game of the season, I mean, he was he was my biggest cheerleader, you know, and he always, you know, after every game, you know, I will call him and I will talk about the game, things that I should have done. And what a lot of people didn't know, that first – Probably my first four games that I played, I had a um, I had a turf toe, uh, so you know I was playing on pretty much uh, one leg almost. So I, you know I really couldn't make the cuts that you know that I that I needed to to be an effective runner in that system. But you know I was just you know just trying to you know bang it out and get through it. But after you know uh, after the fourth or fifth game of me playing, then you know it started to. to, to work yourself out. So Terrell was a key, you know, a key component in, in, in the year that I had, um, you know, after he went down. And that was, it was a magical year for you, Landis, despite problems, physical problems with everyone that year. But uh, 12 games, you know, over 1,100 yards. And, uh, you know, what has to be impressive when you look back is you carried the ball about in the area about 25 times a game. Now, looking back, Orlandis, can you see why the running backs in the league now uh, very rel- rarely get 20 a game because of the physical nature of it? Here you are, 25 times a game. Uh, it's a rough game, and uh, probably nobody can uh, back that statement up more than you. Uh, I'm sure you can see why uh, guys just don't get the 25, 30 carries like they used to. Yeah, definitely, and um, you know, I definitely think it's, it's, it's a great thing, you know, if you know guys to to have two and three, you know, oftentimes four running backs on, on, on the roster that can get the job done, and and because you know, I think we were on the cusp um, of of that, you know, because you know we had you know me, Terrell, Mike Anderson, you know, um, yeah. Clinton Portis, you know, and the list goes on and on after that. Ruben Drones and guys like that. So, I, but we had also it's kind of like new school meets old school mentality. Um, our, our offensive line coach Alex Gibbs. I mean, he was a stickler of, you know, always going and get every inch that you can get, you know, and never go out of bounds and things like that. So, you know, that's the things that that was preached to us. And and, and not just I mean that was the way the game was played at the time. But now I definitely think you know with guys you know. You know, after you can get everything, there's no need to take that, you know, that that extra hit, that unnecessary hit, you know, especially with the things that we're learning about with the uh, concussions and things like that. So I'm definitely happy to see it, and um, you know, and I, I'm happy to see, it. you know, some of the rule changes as well, you know, to protect those guys a little bit more because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, as a fan, you can forget a lot of times that these guys are human beings out there doing something like, you know, that their, their body's not meant to do. So. Um, you know, from a, a fan's perspective, you know, they you take some of the fun or some of the big hits out of the game. But, you know, from a longevity perspective for these guys and their families, I definitely um, can appreciate the, the steps that the NFL and college and, you know, all the way down that they're taking. Well, Landis, uh, your Broncos are off to a 4-2 and two start. Lost a couple here, you know, lately. Lost two in a row. So uh, curious to get your thought, how, thoughts. How do you feel about – what you're seeing from the Broncos so far this season? I'm not, I definitely, I mean, I, I like it. You know, coming off the Super Bowl, I don't think they have they have a, a Super Bowl hangover. You know, I, I definitely think that they everybody got back to business and it's a new year, and they they kicked it in the gear uh, pretty early. So, um, you know, if we can get out of this patch, you know, the first the first half of the season, you know, looking good these next two games, I think they'll be, they'll be pretty good this season. So as you talked about, a lot of the great running backs, and we talked about the great running backs you know have at UGA, but you know you talked about some of the ones that they've had up there in Denver. Right now you got C.J. Anderson, you got Devontae Booker, a rookie, who is actually averaging over a yard more per carry than Anderson is. So you know, curious to get your thoughts on what you're seeing from both of those guys as the next great running backs that uh, the Broncos may have. Yeah, I mean, you know, Denver, it's it's I think it's their secret sauce, you know. Um, I always tell people, um, 
you know, like I mentioned before, Alex Gibbs, and and now you know with Gary Kubiak back, and and a lot of his, you know, uh, Mike Shanahan uh, uh, assistant coaches that are there helping, um, you know, helping with the Broncos. You know, you're starting to see a lot of of it, and when you see. Denver's offense, it reminds you of that. You know, now it's it's old school offense, you know, because you got full you know, more full backs and tight ends in the backfield and things like that, which a lot of uh teams don't use anymore. So, um I definitely think that um, you know, those guys, man, uh C J especially, um, are in great hands and he you know, he's definitely gonna you know, if he keeps it going and stays healthy, man, I definitely think that he'll be uh, you know, probably in line for high uh for for um Hall of Fame bid, man, if he can keep it going. Bob, one more for Orlandis? Yeah, Orlandis, I think we can speak we I probably talked about this last time, but I think it's always interesting for our listeners uh, about playing in Denver, uh the mile high air and everything. Um how did that affect you, uh Orlandis? And I I I'm sure when you guys practiced in that and then went on the road you probably felt you could run all day. Yeah, I'm I definitely, you know, that that air is definitely different up there. And um, you know, it, it's it's something to be said, you know, once it's hard to 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 practice at a game speed. So to me, you know, um, you know, um what my, like I have a 12-year-old son and I always try to get his his guys their football team to practice fast. You know, everybody want to practice at 30%, 50% speed, right? But it's like yeah. you can't wait till game day to go 100% because, you you, you know, you, you're putting a governor on yourself. So, you know, in, in Denver, that's one thing that um, that was kind of like our, you know, our, our conditioning was full speed, you know, full speed through plays all the way like Coach Shanahan would be 20, 30 yards downfield. So we would run all the way down, you know, to Shanahan, past Coach, and that would be our conditioning. So, you know, when when we train like that, especially in the mile high, I think, you know, wherever we go after that, you know, it's gravy because you know, we already train in, in, in the highest altitude. So, um, you know, it, it, it really hurt guys coming in to play us, you know, because – they not really used to that, you know, used to that air. So, um, you know, when they come in, you know, you can see guys sucking wind fairly quickly. Well, Landis, when when you're sitting around with your buddies, what what's one of your favorite stories to share about your time playing, whether it's either at UGA or in the NFL? Uh, I guess um, uh, the problem, I mean, if I had a game, I would say it was um, – Actually, my last game at UGA, uh, when we were playing uh, University of Virginia in the Peach Bowl, you know, we were down, I believe it was 21 points uh, at the half. And, um, you know, it was, you know, bowl games, nothing on the line. You know, people, you would think that, you know, UGA, uh, we were just folded out of 10 and went home. You know, we were playing in, in you know, in, in Georgia, in Atlanta. And, um, you know, we think probably – I was New Year's New Year's Eve, so you would think, you know, people we would just be like, "Where's the party going to be? Where's the New Year's Eve party?" But um, you know, though the guys in the locker room, you know, we just said like, "It's not over." You know, <laughs> we're going to come out, we're going to get the ball, we're going to score, and we're going to win this game. And that's exactly what we did. You know, it was, you know, it was it was one one to me. It was probably you know one of the, one of my my best games ever. Um, you know, being on the field because of the deficit that we came back from, and uh, you know, um, you know, and that Quincy Carter was the quarterback there. You know, Champ Bailey was there. Uh, Matt Stinchcomb, Chris Terry, Jermaine Wiggins. Um, we were all seniors, and you know, we were leaving that year. So, I mean, it was a great way to go out, and um, you know, uh, um, you know, just to bring some some relevancy to to the Peach Bowl. Um, that was the same game that I watched. When I decided that I wanted to go to UGA two years prior, um, Virginia and UGA was uh, in the in the playing in the Peach Bowl, and they announced Coach Donnan got the job at Georgia. And so, you know, we had, when we was at Marshall, you know, we had just lost the national championship game. And so, when Coach D announced that when they announced Coach D was going to Georgia. You know, that kind of piqued my interest. So, you know, I was naturally interested in, you know, following UGA, and they ended up losing a tough game to Virginia, um, you know, for Coach Golf. 
But for us to be able to come out there and win it, it was kind of like a culmination of everything for me. So, um, you know, that was probably one of my fondest memories, in, you know, playing uh, in college. Well, Landis, remind our listeners how they can follow you both online and over social media as well. Um, everything social is Olandis C. Gary, um, at or, you know, on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and I'm on Snapchat as well. And um, that's that's pretty much the best way to, to contact me is, uh, you know, Facebook or, or, or Instagram. Alandis, thank you so much for taking time out of your night to come back on the show. It's always great for Bob and I to get the opportunity to spend some time with you. We hope you'll come back again maybe later on in the season, share more of your stories and your insights with us. You're always so fantastic. Definitely, fellas. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Always our pleasure. Take care, Alandis. All the best to you and your family, my friend. That is uh, former UGA and uh, Denver Broncos running back Olandis Gary and Bob. You know, you, you talk about a guy that you know came from came from Marshall, spent two years at UGA, and uh, boy, what a what a wonderful stable of running backs they had then. And they just seemed to every year have really good running backs coming out of coming out of uh, coming out of Georgia. Now they got Nick Chubb uh, as well, but uh, he was certainly you know two year two really good years at UGA. That's right, and when he started, uh, when he took over in Denver, everybody said, you know, Landis Gary, where's he from? Well, where else? Georgia, right? Like you had said, right. there, it was a pedigree at the time, but uh, really a magical year, Chris. Those who remember that uh, 99 season uh, when he took over, uh, my goodness, he had uh, those fans in Denver on their toes, seven touchdowns. All, like, again, 1,200 yards in 12 games. I mean, he was uh, it was just a great back. And uh, as as we see every time we speak to him, a, tre- a tremendous gentleman as well. That's right. All right, we've got our next guest, Bo Bach, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Bo on the other side of the station identification. This is Reggie Kelly, former Cincinnati Bengals and Atlanta Falcons tight end. And you're listening to TNT, Thursday Night Tailgate. Brace yourself for the explosion. Now back with us and making his fifth appearance on the Kyvin Foods guest line is the Dean of Atlanta Sports Talk Radio, Mr. Bo Bach. And let me remind you a little bit more about Bo's background. He, is, he was born in the Bronx, played his college football at the University of Miami. Bo has been the voice of Atlanta Sports Talk Radio since 1973, and no one knows more about the sports teams and their histories here and around Atlanta and Georgia than Bo does. He's become a wonderful friend of the show, and we're very excited he is back with us again tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Bo, Chris, and Bob, thanks for coming back on the show. Hi, Bo. Hey, let me go to the refrigerator and get a beer. I'll be right back. <laughs> Be our guest. Yeah, time. Get a beer. Yeah. How are you guys? I appreciate you having oh, me on. And by the way, I appreciate awesome. all the support you give me um, throughout the month. Thank you. Absolutely. So, Bo, I want to start our time. I want to start our time with you tonight by uh, getting your thoughts on the University of Georgia season so far. You just heard we were talking with Orlandis Gary there, and I, I think there were high expectations with Kirby Smart coming back and taking over as, you know, a head coach. It's been a tough start, right? Lost three of their last four, lost to Old Miss, Tennessee, Vandy. Last Saturday had to particularly sting to, to UGA fans. Is, is this a program that's actually, you know, regressing, Bo, or is this just a, yeah. you know, hey, let's be patient, it's Kirby, Kirby Smart's, you know, time, he'll, he'll get his system and players in here. Right. No, I, w- I was just out, and somebody bumped into me and said, "Hey, give Kirby a chance. Give because I write a commentary every night, you know, and I'm, I've just been killing Kirby and let him get his own people in there." Well, I'll tell you what. It's not just the games we've lost, and not just the way we've looked, uh, but there's been absolutely nothing brought to the program by Kirby Smart. Uh, no identity. No playing personality. Uh, no intangibles. We're not more physical. Just been and and he he's been a dud. He's been mostly you know missing in action as far as uh, being a head coach of a major football institution is concerned. And for all intents and purposes, nobody left and nobody arrived. It's terrible. So you know it's interesting, Bo. As you kind of look back over the last several years, right? You go, I mean, go all the way back to when you know Herschel left Georgia, right? His last season there was 1982. So over the last 33 years, you know, Chris, Georgia Chris, has averaged Chris, nearly four losses 
a season, four and three, like we say so far this year, yeah. and they seem to always yeah. have one of the top recru- recruiting classes, top recruiting classes right. in the country. Yeah. Yet they're, they're never a top five or a top ten team. Why is it? Why is this program always seemed to Chris, do less with more? Chris, Chris, I mean, this is my whole deal. This is what I go to every single day. Nobody down here understands. The newspaper doesn't understand. Nobody's ever said what you just said. Nobody ever says. I'm the only one who says it. It's the most (laughs) underachieving football program in college football. Every year we have the best athletes in the country. And every year I'm just watching uh, Miami and Virginia Tech. And, uh, you know, Mark Rick, and, and, and it just occurred to me, you know, Mark Rick's teams are submissive, you know, and, and then you go back to, to Dooley. You know why Georgia's Georgia and Alabama's Alabama? Because of Bear Bryant and Vince Dooley, that whole period, you know, while they're building and they're, and they're adding to their legacy, we're just going through the motions back here with the best athletes in the in the country who never saw the light of day, by the way, and just going with uh, with uh, Vince's you know, run offense in the same formation, the same play every single time, and never stretched the talent that we had on hand. We and and always wanting to bring us home at seven wins because that would keep him, keep his job. It was it was horrendous. It tore my heart out. All those years, Chris, that this was going on and nobody was saying anything. It's in it's in our Why? water. There's something wrong. I don't know. The newspaper's <laughs> vanilla. I'm the I'm the crazy guy down here because I'm the only one who says this, and everybody thinks I'm nuts. <laughs> it's the most frustrating thing in the world. Bob, questions for Bo? Uh, Bo, it's always a pleasure. I. Uh... I don't know where to start with you. How about the let's go to baseball for one minute, Bob? Because the, the, yeah, the Braves. Sure. I don't want to keep uh, bringing up bad uh, memories for you, but the Braves. Right. You know, Bo, going into a new stadium, uh, you, you would think you know they'd have a little juice momentum going on. My goodness, Bo, this was a team that uh, had the almost the worst home record in baseball. How tough was it? looking at them at home every year and seeing a team that played 20 games under 500 in their backyard. No, it's been very, very frustrating. You know, we've been underachieving, um, you know, with that team since 1990. I talk about, you know, sure, also throw 14 division championships. Well, hey, you know what? We're in the weakest division of baseball, you know, for those entire years. Secondarily, we won one time out of 14, and, and you know, Bobby's in the Hall of Fame. And, you know, let me tell you something. That whole that whole mindset of Bobby is, you know, we, we were a great baseball team, but, you know, we were a better golf team. You know what I mean? That, you know, that was Bobby's, Bobby's regime. <laughs> he, you know, it, was, it was like, you know, uh, run everything out, wear your uniform properly, no music in the clubhouse, and be here on time. Other than that, play 18 holes a day. We don't care. You know, it, I'm telling you, it, it, you know, it was it, for Bobby Cox to be in the Hall of Fame is the most extraordinary thing I, I've ever seen in my life. And it's because of the media here. We have no sports media. You, the, you know, it's all owned by Cox. And Cox owns the AJC, the one newspaper in town. They have the dominant radio station, the dominant TV station. It's not supposed to happen. It's against the law. But these guys had it grandfathered in. And and they control the whole deal, and they're in bed with every team we have here. You should see, you're talking about, too, you should see Georgia Tech with this guy, uh, Paul Johnson, running that high school offense. You talk about one of the great legacies in all of college football is uh, is Georgia Tech, Bobby Dodd Stadium. I mean, 1922, that's where the four horsemen first ran together was on Grant Field. You know, now you look at the four horsemen, the four horsemen are rolling over in their grave looking at what's being played on top of their field. Mm. It's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. It's, uh, it's tough. And, and... 
And, Bo, what can you tell us about the, the new stadium uh, as far as amenities uh, and travel, everything? Give us a, your, baseball, your... baseball or, or football. You know, we've got about... that uh, Mercedes-Benz thing with the, you yeah. know, with the magic roof and all that stuff. And then you got SunTrust <laughs> Stadium where the Braves are moving in, in yeah. Cobb County. And, you know, that was, a, that was an overnight deal. That was a nighttime deal, you know. And, you know, Cobb County voters never had a chance to vote on it. Uh, you know, the Braves never even announced it. You know, who knows what went on in, 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 in those meetings. But uh, there's no parking up there. There's no public transportation there. It, and, and it's a traffic mess right now. The people can't even imagine what it's going to be like. Oh, boy. So you know, well, let's talk a little... Our... You know, Chris, Go all ahead. of our Southern sports are built on cronyism. You know, it's who you know and who's your guy. And, you know, and, and it's like, don't say anything about it if he's on our you – know, it's, it's, it's the weirdest – if I could write, and I write every night, but I write, like, for radio and stuff like that. But if I could write a book, I'd write about this because it would be highly acclaimed by psychiatrists and by sociologists <laughs> and everyone trying to figure out what the hell is going on here. <laughs> so, Bo, let's switch gears a little bit to the to the Falcons, right? And the fans here, pretty excited, right? Despite a bad call last Sunday that likely cost them a yeah. win over the Seahawks, but their offense, boy, looking good, ranked you know first in yards hey. and points per game. Matt Ryan looking good. What yeah. do, What do you think about the Falcons so far? The, the most amazing thing I've seen. I mean, it really is, and, and, and no one around here even saw it. And, and in fact, I heard their play-by-play guy saying today on the radio, if anything, you know, that third quarter against Seattle will be the very, very point to us, the turning point. It happened after week one. It happened between, actually week two uh, between the Raiders and um, the Saints. All of a sudden, you know, those first two games, and, and you know, in that first game especially against Tampa Bay, we came out like it was 2015. We were flat. We were listless. You know, there was no energy, right? All of a sudden, we come out against the Saints, and we were a different football team. We're running. We're chasing. We're hitting. The intensity there, all the physicality was there that you want. Matt Ryan's running no huddle. And instead of us, you know, uh, uh, being submissive to the defense, he's dealing. And we're scoring a totally different football team. And each week we've gotten better. And, you know, think about what we went through in the first six weeks at Oakland, at New Orleans, at Denver, at Seattle. And, and and to come out of it with that record where after a while we were at at the end of last year is remarkable. And, and I take my hat off to Dan Quinn, who at first I thought was a godsend because, I, you know, I would have thought so if uh, uh, Beelzebub had replaced uh, Smitty, <laughs> crying out loud. <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't have been more excited. <laughs> but uh, So I jumped on Dan Quinn's bandwagon. And then I then I lost that. I didn't see what he brought to the party, and you know, and he's always saying I'm jacked, and I'm you know, you know. And then all of a sudden they show up like this, and I said, look at the residual value of this man's coaching. I imagine that's got to be what it is, because all of a sudden, after all this time, we came together. Even after last year's winning streak, that was old timey Falcons. That was just you know, chromosomes coming together and the earth and the wind and the moon and the fire and all that stuff coming together. You know, eventually every team's going to have a win streak. But it was nothing distinctive. All of a sudden, when you when you get to see us, we, we play San Diego this week, guys. But when you get to see us, we are a different football team. You won't even recognize us. And to that end, Bo, right, if you look out at the yeah. rest of the Falcons' schedule currently – only two teams above 500 are left right. out there. They got the three and two Eagles and the four and two Chiefs. So it's not a stretch at all. I don't think right. that, that the Falcons could no. end up as you know a number two seed, right? Hey, Chris and Bobby, uh, I guarantee you this team is going to make a run. They're going to make a run. Yeah, I, I'll tell you that. You know, think about getting through you know that uh, baton death, death march they just did. 
uh, and be in the shape they did, plus be a different football team. In other words, you know, you know, we're not mechanical anymore and we're not soft anymore. We're a totally transformed uh, football team. And I, I can't find out why. Nobody seems to know. Everybody seems to, to think up there that we just came together, you know. So it, it's amazing. Bob but where do you see Matt Ryan? Where do you see Matt Ryan deal? You know, when he gets in that no huddle, man, he runs the show and he knows the game and he just he's got the best tempo I've seen for no huddle, you know, in the league. And that's what I was going to ask you about Ryan Bowe as far as uh, how he's received down there. You know, there were times where people were saying, "Yeah, he's got talent. We don't know if he can get us to the promised land." Uh, now, of right. course. You know, uh, it, it's uh, they're talking yeah. about an offensive juggernaut. They've scored 50 more right. points than New England. So, uh, right. yeah, you're you you started to get into it about Ryan, uh, just a good guy and, and a very talented oh, yeah, player, yeah, yeah. probably in his yeah. finest, in his prime right now. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, it's really he he was dealt a, a bad hand because when he got here, it was after Michael Vick and the way my, and Michael Vick was a huge favorite um, mm. here. And when he went down, um, you know, and then and then, or, or the way he went out, and then Ryan taking over, uh, Matt Ryan's never had the benefit of good publicity. That and the fact that he's a great quarterback, a great quarterback, and the newspaper or none of the media would ever point that out or ever celebrate him. So the guy is doing it now, and even people can't even see it now. You know, the, you know, I, I I feel for the guy, and and I shouldn't feel for anybody making making the, you know, almost two million dollars a month, <laughs> but I feel for the guy because he's not gotten his due. Yeah, it's uh, he, he is something. Thirty one years old. Uh, you got to think he's got another few years. Uh, a good yeah. One, but it's- Seventy, almost seventy percent of his pad. He's he's in, he's in a zone right now, Bo. And right, uh, you, know, right. you got a guy like uh, Freeman who could run the ball, and Julio right. Jones. Julio Jones, we mentioned earlier in the show. Uh, he's a horse. You know, he is, and uh, he's kind of your typical receiver right now, uh, Bo. And he got a bad break last week during that Seattle game. But uh, six four, two hundred twenty pounds. Um, my goodness, uh, the, the sky's the limit yeah. for him, too. He's, right, uh, right. he's in his prime, too, 27 years old. Right, and then we've got a guy on the other side, Mohamed Sanu, who hopefully will will make hay you know, when they double Julio, because Julio's the only guy on our team that had to double. And a year ago, you could take him away, because Reggie White you know, was done. He couldn't be a factor. So now we bring in Mohamed Sanu from the Bengals, and he's balancing the field a little bit, and you get the running uh, of, of Devontae Freeman uh, in the in in the backfield, and we've got great offensive balance. And then we've got Tammy, this tight end who doesn't drop a ball, and everybody seems to be responding. So, Bo, before so we I, let I, you I go, expect a good run. Yeah, Bo, remind our listeners what what are some other projects you're working on, and how can they follow you? Over social media. You know, I, I, I've got my website that's uh, just uh, under construction right now. All that's on it now is my commentaries and all that stuff. It's, it will be up in about a week, and that's BoboxSports.com. And it's B-E-A-U-B-O-C-K, BoboxSports.com. And then I'm at Bobox790 on Twitter. And, um, you know, that's and then I do a commentary every night which I send out to, we've got 8,200 guys who get this uh, every morning, is a, a commentary. And so if anyone would like to get that, just uh, send it to me. Send me your email address at bobach at gmail.com. Bo, right. well, we hope you'll come back and uh, later on in the season continue to share your insights with us. You know, you've become one of our favorite guests here on Thursday night. Oh, I appreciate we can't it, thank you enough for all of your time. Love yeah, you. I can't wait to come back. I really enjoy being on your show because uh, you guys ask good questions, and you know what I'm talking about. You don't think I'm crazy. No. <laughs> they got to be a little crazy to do what we do. <laughs> I'll see you guys. Right. Thanks. All right, All right take care, Bo. That is uh, the dean of Atlanta Sports Talk Radio, Mr. Bo Bach. Always a good time, Bob, when we get to spend uh, a little bit of time with Bo.
Ah, we love him, and he's, uh, yeah, so refreshing, and uh, you talk about intensity, and, uh, yeah, if you get a chance to listen to his uh, commentaries, uh, terrific stuff, and uh, right on top of stuff, like we say about Paul Alexander in Pittsburgh, Chris, you want to know about Atlanta stuff, get in touch with Bo. Yeah, exactly right. No one knows more about what goes on in this town and the sports the sports are in and around Atlanta and the, obviously the University of Georgia and Georgia Tech as well than Bo Bach does. So Bo Bach, you know, at 790, you know, look him up on uh, on Twitter and uh, BoBachSports.com. Keep your eyes on that because there's going to be some great stuff coming out, I'm sure, from our good friend Bo Bach. All right, before we get to our next guest, Omar Moreno, I want to give a shout-out to our good friend Renee Shaw over at uh, Career Engagement Institute. Folks, if you're upside down in your career, and what do we mean by that, right? You're ready to move on. Go to careerengagement.institute to see how our, our friend Renee Shaw can help you. You heard uh, you know, one of our guests, you know, Thursday Night Tailgate Hall of Famer now, Toy Cook, singing Renee's praises the last time he joined us. And if you work, for, you work with Renee for two minutes, you're going to understand exactly why Toy said that and why we brag about Renee every single week here on Thursday Night Tailgate. We all want to work with someone who we can trust and who actually has our best interests at heart. And you know how rare it is to find somebody like that. Well, no one fits that description any better than Renee Shell does. She's a wonderfully talented lady, the kind of person you want to work with and have working for you. She's been doing some great things for some of our guests who have been in transition from being pro athletes and are now getting into the job market. Folks, I'm telling you, Renee is just the very best. There isn't a better way to describe her than that. If you're an athlete or anyone in the job market, do yourself a favor and reach out to Renee. You're going to be so very glad that you did. Go to careerengagement.institute online and give her a follow on Twitter, at Integrated Play. All right, now joining us on the Kyvin Foods guest line is one of my favorite baseball players of all time, and that is former Pirate center fielder Omar Moreno. Let me give you some more background on Omar. He's from Panama. He was signed by the Pirates as a free agent back in 1969, debuted in the major leagues in 1975, and he played in the majors from 75 to 1986 for the Pirates, Astros, Yankees, Royals, and Braves. He won a World Series with the We Are Family Pirates back in 1979, overcoming a 3-1 to deficit to the Baltimore Orioles, winning the last two games on the road in Baltimore. He hit 311 that postseason with a 354 on on-base percentage. Omar led the major leagues in stolen bases in 1978 with 71. He led the National League in 79 with 77 more steals. And as Bob mentioned last week and earlier tonight on the show, he came back in 1980 and had 96 stolen bases, which was amazingly only good for second in the National League that year, ending one behind Expos outfielder Ron LaFleur. He ended his career with 487 stolen bases, which is 42nd all-time. He played in every game in 1979 and 1980. He led the league in at-bats and averaged 751 plate appearances over those two seasons. He's one of the premier leadoff hitters in baseball history. Uh, so so over, over the course of his career, I don't, I'm not sure there was anybody any better than Omar Moreno was, and I'm very thrilled that he is back with us or here tonight with us on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Omar, Chris, and Bob here. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Omar. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So, Omar, let's Hello. start by going back to when you were originally signed by the Pirates. How did you go from a free agent to joining the Pirates organization back in 69? Well, I signed when at the age of 16 years old by uh, by Herbert Rayburn in Panama. The same scout signed on a... Rene Stene and uh, Manny Sanguillen. Wow. Long time ago, yes. Yes. At the age of 16. Wow. And, and Omar, you, you played several years, you know, with one, one of my idols growing up, Willie Stargell. Now, I'm curious to get your thoughts. What are some of your favorite memories of playing with Willie? Well, Willie was a special for me, so that's what we call him, Pop. This is the guy who inspired me to to play this game, William Roberto Clemente. Well, Roberto was before me, you know, but William right. Roberto was always me. Yeah. And, and Omar, you know, to, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, please, finish your thought. No, Willie, I learned so much from, from Willie. You know, that's what we call, we used to call him Pop in, uh, in, uh, in our team in 1979. Mm-hmm. And, and Omar, you know, your clubhouse, right? You know, we, we, we all know about the We Are Family theme that you guys had. It always seemed like you guys truly were a close-knit group. You had some characters 
in that clubhouse with you know guys like Dave Parker and Phil Garner, plus obviously you know Willie as a as a father figure, Manny Sanguian in there as well. John Candelaria, John Candelaria seemed like a guy who liked to stir up some trouble now and then. Talk about what it was like being with those guys off the field. Well, was, I learned so much from those guys. I, mean, I was I was very lucky to play with those guys. I, mean, I learned so much from not, not only for the Willie and the, the Parker. And I learned so much from 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 Chuck Tanner. Phil Garner, Tim Foley, uh, Candelaria, Grant Jackson, many Sangi Yen, and uh, all those guys. I, mean, I learned so much from those guys uh, in 1979. Not only in 1979, since in, when, when I came to Big League. Mm-hmm. Bob, questions for Omar? Uh, Omar, we've heard, uh, you mentioned Chuck Tanner. We've heard so much about him as being a player's manager but uh, he knew the game. Uh, just give us more thoughts about him. Seemed like a, a really good baseball man. Yes, yes. He's a very respect guy. You know, the respect. The, we have to play hard, respect the player. We respect him, you know. And a uh, good guy, great guy. Try to keep everybody together, you know. That's why we win the 1979 World Series. Not only because uh, 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 we got a good team. But Chuck is a person that tried to keep everybody together, tried to play hard for him, and, and tried to do the best for, the, for our fans in, in Pittsburgh. And, Omar, while you were stealing all the bases in Pittsburgh over those years, uh, what was it like for you as far as did you have the, the go? Uh, was it up to you to run all the time, or did you have to okay with the manager? How, how did that work out for you? Well, uh, well, I got a green light, yes. It gave me green lights, and... Uh, and uh, when I played with, with Chuck, my sec- my first year I played with Danny Morta, but I played only one month. But when I, Chuck right. came come from from Oakland, Oakland from the A's, and he started to, he saw me uh, play me in a in center field on a, a kind of speed I have, so they gave me green lights. So I feel more comfortable. One day I talked to him, I told him, Chuck, I feel better when you give me green light because I'm gonna work with Team Foley. So I I, I work with team, that time I work with Team Foley. So I give him sign when I'm gonna to go to to try to steal second base. And 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 Omar, in that stretch from 1977 to 1980, when you stole almost 300 bases, attempted nearly 100 each year, and like I said, you you played all 162 games in '79 and in 1980. Did your body? Take a beating after all of those games and all those head first slides into second. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I had to stay in chair. Yeah, yeah, it was hard for me, you know, play every day, catch all those balls in center field, run from from second to third, from fourth to fourth. You know, it was hard, but I try. You know, I I, I went to the ballpark early, tried to prepare for that for the game as I did for all those years. And Omar, in that 1979 World Series, the Orioles won three of the first four games. They scored a lot of runs, eight runs in game three, nine runs in game four. Only managed to score two runs, though, over the last three games. Was there a particular adjustment that you guys made that made such a big difference? Yeah, my first time when I we went, went to Baltimore, we went, I think we lost the game. With, with Flanagan because I know Flanagan when since we used to be in a minor league, we play we play in three play with Flanagan and uh, McGregor. So I was and in my first my first day uh, I tried to you know I was tried to too hard you know because I want to want to get in base so bad I want it. But on the second days I uh, I was talking to Willie I say you know and Chuck Turner and uh, I was more relaxed and I want to start to hit the ball good. And Omar, you had a big game in Game 7. You were 3-for-5 in that game, including an RBI single in the ninth. You scored later on on a bases-loaded walk to give you guys a 4-to-1 cushion going into the bottom of the ninth. But you guys were down one to nothing through five innings until Willie hit that two-run home run to give you guys a 2-to-1 lead in the sixth. What were the nerves like for you going through that Game 7? Well, you know, we come, we, we came from behind. We win those. We win the last game in, in Pittsburgh. Then we would, the next day we we went to Baltimore. Win the, that game, and uh, and the next day we be uh we we was behind. But we, we got a good team. We used to got a good team. And those guys, I believe, I said, well, soon the, I start to get in base and try to put pressure to those guys. I think we we we're going to make. 
Bob Moore for Omar? Yeah, Omar, and after you left Pittsburgh, uh, first of all, uh, spending most of your career there, you'd go on to play for four other teams, but uh, was it hard leaving Pittsburgh, uh, Omar, after having spent so much time in there and having so much success there? Yeah, it was hard. It, it, it's, um, at that time, it was hard for me because I signed with Pittsburgh. I know everybody here in Pittsburgh. That people play for people more for for this organization, people more for 15 years since the minor league, since it was, I was 16 years old. It was kind of hard for me to go to another team, but you know, this is part of the game, and uh, I know sooner or later I had to get out of Pittsburgh. So from there, from from film, I went to free agent to play with Houston, and Houston, they trained me to New York, and then yeah. I, I played with, with Atlanta which, when Chuck was there. And those those Yankee teams of the early '80s, uh, Omar. I was in the in the stadium an awful lot during those days, and, and they remember you well. Uh, and that was Yogi Berra, Billy yeah. Martin. Still, those days. Oh, uh, did you have good memories of the old Yankee Stadium? No, like this for. No. I played against with uh, I played with those guys, and Rigetti was there, and Gitty was right. there, Marinelli was there, and Winfield. Um, Ricky Henderson was there, uh, Piniela, all those guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I had a good time in, in New York. Yes. Yeah. Omar, after after stealing 77 bases in the 1979 regular season, no stolen bases in the World Series. Was that a result of you guys just being behind in this series, or was it because you know, as you talk about Scott McGregor and Mike Flanagan, right? Both really tough lefties. Were those guys just? Was it a, a, an issue of let's not run because we're behind, or was it because those two lefties were hard to run on? No, no, no. I know those guys since it was minor league. I know my, uh, um, Flanagan and McGregor. We play, we play each against each other. When they was in Rochester, New York, I, would, I was in in Charleston, West Virginia. The thing is, I was I was so cold. Like, I was talking to Tim Foley. Like, I told Tim Foley, like, "You better be ready, Tim, because." Uh, when I get a chance to, to go, I go. But you better be ready because I know they're going to give you a lot of fastballs, so you be ready. To, because if, if I got a chance to steal, I go. And Omar, you caught the final out of that World Series. When the, when the ball was in the air headed your way, did it enter oh, your God. mind, I'm, I'm about to catch the last out and we're going to be World Series champions here? Yeah, that's right. I, I catch the last out when I remember uh, the, the last time uh, uh, Pat Kelly hit the ball over there. I said, I got it, I got it. But I think uh, John Mino or Bill Robinson was on the field. It's when the left center. I, said, I told the guy, no, let me have it, let me have it, because I, this is, the game is over right now. So, Omar, what what was it like being a part of that World Series championship parade when you guys got back to Pittsburgh? Well, it was something special. Something you work, we worked so hard for, for almost for eight years to get there. So, you know, it was it's something special. It, I, I can imagine yeah, that special was when uh, we won the World Series, when I make the last album in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. So, Omar, what are you doing now? Well, right now, I, I, I live here in Pittsburgh, so I went to the spin. I, last two years, I, they invited me to go to spin training to work with, uh, to work with uh, those guys in the outfield, Polanco, Martez, and all those guys in the base running. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm still here in Pittsburgh. I'm, I'm looking for jobs, you know. I think I want to get in baseball because I think I, I can help. I can help a lot of, in, uh, in baseball. A lot of things to give in baseball. So right now I'm here in peaceful waiting for those meetings. So I, I send my resume to different different organizations. So I hope I get a chance to, to get, back, get back in baseball. Well, Omar, thank you so much for taking time out of your night to be a part of the show with us tonight. It's a true honor for us to have you as part of our show Thursday Night Tailgate tonight. We hope you'll come back and, and you know join us again sometime, share more of your stories and your insights with us. We wish you the best of luck getting back into the game because there wasn't a better leadoff hitter and certainly not a better base dealer during your time. Okay, in the thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, Gaia. Take care, thank Omar. You, All the best to you and your thank family. You. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. That is uh, former Pirates World Series champion center fielder Omar Moreno. And, Bob, you know, you you talked about it last week. You talked about it at the beginning of the show. Uh, Unbelievable 
the idea that a guy stole 96 bases and wasn't the league leader. But you look at 71, then 77, then 96 deals. Those are seemingly numbers we'll never see again. I can't imagine guys getting in the 90 to 100 stolen bases you know, in, in a season anymore. Not even close, Chris. It's such a different game. And uh, you're right, about 96 stolen bases and, and coming in, that'll never happen again. I think that's the highest total ever to be a runner-up. Come on, that's insane. But uh, to, to be like him, Chris, and uh, looking for a job in baseball, I mean, for a team that has a guy that can run, you would think uh, they would want his services um, to to increase the stolen bases. I know it's a, the game has changed a lot, Chris, but if you have a guy with a lot of speed, say like a guy on, like on the Dodgers, like a guy like Tolls or somebody like that, uh, kind of, uh, you know, unpolished, I would want a guy like Moreno uh, trying to teach this guy how to steal bases because no one was better uh, in the early late 70s and early 80s than this guy, and I'm, I'm just glad I was born in that era to be able to watch him. Oh, yeah, I tell you, Bob, you know, and, and, you know, as a kid, you know, of the 70s and going back to Three River Stadium and and uh, and, and watching Omar and, and those and those Pirates teams play. Now, remember, right, in, you know, in the in the mid-70s, right, you, know, you had the Big Red Machine, you know, in the National League East where the Pirates used to play in the National League East. They were battling those great Phillies teams. Remember those great, great Phillies teams in the oh, yeah. in the mid-70s with, uh, you know, guys like Greg Luzinski and Mike Schmidt and Bob Boone and Steve Carlton and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, had to battle those guys and then, you know, lost out to them, th- finished second place. And the Pirates were winning, you know, 95-plus games a season and still finishing second to those, those Phillies teams and missing out on the playoffs and finally getting over the hump in 79 and then taking it, you know, taking it all the way. But boy, what, I mean, it's so much fun watching that 79 team with, you know, how close they were as a, as a team and the, and the players that they had and just, you know, how the lineup just all worked with Moreno. And he talked about Tim Foley, you know, and they brought Foley and Bill Madlock over through the course of that season. But, you know, Mer, you know Tim Foley and the, and the way that he would choke way up on the bat and be able to, you know, get a single here or there and, and you know, was a great second-place hitter to give, you know, Omar the opportunity, you know, to steal all of those bases and could take pitches and, and all that sort of thing and go the opposite way. And then Dave Parker batting third and what a great player he was in 78 and 79, 77 as well. And then Willie, you know, for what a wonderful player he was in winning the MVP there in 79. And just, you know, they were just so perfectly matched as a as a lineup, and then you know the, to see the you know the, the the kinship that they had you know off the field and in the dugout and that sort of thing. But what, a, what you know it was just it was such a pro, uh, pleasure watching that team. They have a sp- very special place in my heart. Yeah, and you mentioned balance, Chris. We uh, often overlook guys like Moreno because you think of '79, you think of just a team that that they, that can just hit and bash the ball. But um, Moreno was the speed part of that, Chris. People forget. He led the league in 80, uh, had 13 triples. He had 25 triples in that two-year period. Um, And, uh, again, an outrageous uh, total of uh, about 175 stolen bases in two years. It was was just fun to watch. Again, you get this guy, and, and when you could see him going from first to third on a triple, it was fun to watch because he could fly. And, uh, like you said, played in every game two years in a row on that hard field when it was Three River Stadium, Chris. His legs did take a beating, right. but um, still around to talk about it. And, uh, my goodness, uh, great memories just talking to him. Absolutely right. And a uh, big thrill tonight to get the opportunity to talk to Omar Moreno. Yeah. All right, when Bob and I come back, we'll be turning on the Thursday Night Tailgate Spotlight on the Positive, and then we'll wrap up the show, and we'll do that on the other side of these words from our friends over at Coastal Orthopedics and Kyvin Foods. Are you suffering from chronic pain in your shoulders, hips, knees, or wrists? Tired of living life with an old injury that just won't go away? If you answered yes to either of these questions, we can help. At Coastal Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, Dr. Candelora and his fine staff of medical professionals will get you back on the road to recovery. Their state-of-the-art facility and attention to detail will ensure you will be enjoying life again and feeling invincible in no time. Since 1991, Dr. Candelora and Coastal Orthopedics have been specializing in joint replacement, arthritis, and osteoporosis care, as well as pediatric and adult general orthopedics. Visit us on the web 
www.bone-dr.com. Or call our Newport Ritchie office just north of Tampa at 727-848-1417. Proud sponsors of Mike Ditka's The Gridiron Greats Assistance Fund. This is Reggie Kelly, former Cincinnati Bengals and Atlanta Falcon tight end. And I'm the owner of Kyvin Foods. And if you enjoy delicious food, you're going to love my Kyvin products, which consists of our honey apple salsa, sweet barbecue sauce, and an array of seasonings. For store locations, online orders, and recipes, check out our website at www.kyvin82.com. That's K-Y-V-A-N 82.com. One taste, and you'll appreciate the goodness. Hey, hey, welcome back. This is Todd Washington, two-time Super Bowl champ, offensive line coach for the Baltimore Ravens, and you are listening to Thursday Night Tailgate with my boys Chris Moscato and Bob Lazari on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Go get them, guys. Hey, we're back here on Thursday Night Tailgate, and we're turning on our spotlight on the positive. Bob, who do you have for us this week? Well, Chris, we're going to stay here uh, local in New England and talk about the things that Danny, Danny Amendola does. You know, I was uh, looking at some of the Patriots, very charitable group up here, but uh wanted to find out more about what he did and uh, has something called Catches for Kids, his own uh, organization, Chris. And if you go to the website, it's dannyamendola.org. Uh, it gives you the mission on there. Um, the mission is basically to improve the lives of low-income children and families in need by providing daily support, opportunities, resources, and life-changing experiences. Now, he does it in a, a variety of different ways, Chris. He's, uh, he, has, he had a celebrity waiters uh, thing at a, re- uh, at a restaurant this past summer where he had guys like Garoppolo and Brady, and they all came out and they actually waited at a local restaurant. And all the uh, proceeds went to a bunch of uh, different things. Now, part of that catches for kids. He has a back-to-school program where he uh, actually he'll get kids like to a local Walmart, Chris, and uh, he'll give them backpacks full of back-to-school supplies and gift cards at Walmart, things like that, uh, so kids can have a, a fair shot in beginning the school year. And then a lot of the proceeds also go to this thing uh, that he calls the Catch-A-Book Room, which gives uh, at-risk students, they have a lot of ask, access to books uh, that they can read with friends and families. And um, he ac- actually will help improve and maintain libraries uh, throughout schools uh, in the inner cities. So, again, he's a bi- big into education, Chris. And, uh, again, um, you know, he goes under the radar because of the superstars up here in New England. But uh, he is a superstar off the field. Kudos to Danny Amendola. There you go. Bob, tonight I'm going to put the spotlight on uh, Browns running back Isaiah Crowell. You may recall that uh, earlier this year people were outraged at Crowell for the picture that he posted out on Instagram of a of a police officer being stabbed in the neck, and he did that in response to some of the issues going on between the African-American community and our law enforcement agents. He, uh, he quickly deleted that uh, that uh, Instagram post, but, you know, damage was done. It was already out there. Scott Van Pelt of ESPN, I believe, you know, summed up the situation, Bob, best in a, in a piece he recently did saying, there's no room in the outrage cycle for the follow-up. Say or do something foolish, it gets discovered, people get livid, demand to get their pound of flesh, angry mob moves on. Nobody gets concerned about what comes next because they're on to the next thing. Well, Bob, what came next for Isaiah Crowell was he was big enough to realize that what he did wasn't right. He didn't know, you know, what it was like to be a police officer or to walk in their shoes. So here's what he did. Following the shooting deaths of the police officers down in Dallas, he went down there and attended one of the funerals. He received an education on police service and their sacrifices from the local police department and uh, particularly Sergeant uh, Dimitri Penny was uh, was the police sergeant that he reached out to, and the two have you know, since become good friends. Crowell promised and came through on donating the first game check from, uh, from this season to the Dallas Fallen Officers Foundation, a game check for him that was uh, $35,300. So Crowell said, you know, that, you know, it was just the first of many things that he planned to do in order to atone for that Instagram post. 
Mary Kay Abbott of Cleveland.com wrote a piece about this as well. And in her article, she wrote that Officer Penny said Crowell has become like a little brother. He's become a long-term sponsor for their foundation. Crowell is also going to be involved with the widows of the fallen officers' families. And Officer Penny also believes it's you know not coincidental, by the way, that Crowell is running with a renewed vigor this season. It's another way that Crowell is finding daylight out of the darkness. He's a top 10 rusher in the league this season. He's averaging 5.2 yards per carry. So, you know, Bob, kudos to Isaiah Crowell for turning things around, right, and following up and following through on a promise to make a difference in the lives of the families of our fallen police uh, officers. So kudos to uh, Isaiah Crowell and uh, to Danny Amendola for, uh, you know, for uh, Amendola for doing the great things that he's doing, like you pointed out, and to uh, Crowell for, uh, you know, sort of you know, making a positive out of a negative, if, if you will, Bob. Oh, Chris, that's a great story about Crowell. So often, a lot of these guys uh, that uh, make a bad mistake, uh, it's, it's almost like they can't say, I made a mistake. They'll continue on a downward destruction or uh, do something or just continue to wallow in uh, their, uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm never wrong mentality. But it takes a real man and a real good person to uh, say, hey, I made a mistake and I am going to do this, 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 and that to show you that it was a bad mistake and uh, this isn't this isn't just a PR stunt, guys. This is this is the real deal, and uh, that goes beyond the football field, Chris. That's a life lesson right there. Yeah, no, great points, Bob. Absolutely right. So uh, kudos to both guys for making a, a a real difference. And you're right, Bob. You know, so many times we see you know guys just don't want to they don't want to own up to that mistake, and they just you know crawl away and hide, and you know the, the angry mob is. As uh, as pointed out in you know in the story, will go away. Well, he uh, he owned up to it and is making a real difference. You're right; it's not a PR stunt. Yeah. So, folks, these are two stories, exactly why we do this segment every week, letting you know about great things that current or former players are doing to make a positive impact on the lives of people, really around the world. All right, Bob, it is time for us to put a bow on this episode. We want to thank again Lisa Kelly, Tony Collins, Olandis Gary, Bo Bach, and Omar Moreno for joining us tonight. And, Bob, as I say every single week, one of the greatest parts of the night is getting to spend a couple hours with you, my friend. Uh, That's so great. Thank you for your kindness, sir. And, again, uh, the feeling is mutual, and uh, we had some great guests tonight, some good old friends, some new ones, and, uh, hey, that's why we do it every week. We have a blast. That's exactly right. All right, next week, who do we have scheduled to join us? Well, author Jeff Perlman will be back with us. He joined us a little bit earlier this year. He's got a new book out called Gunslinger about Brett Favre, and it's due out next week, so we look forward to talking with Jeff. Our good friend and uh, TNT Hall of Famer, Zig Fricasse, going to be back with us. I'm sure we'll be talking about his Cowboys, uh, plus get his thoughts on what they should do once Tony Romo is ready to come back. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit of hockey with Zig as well. Another guy who's been a great friend of the show over over the last several years is a former Dolphins, Redskins, and Chargers defensive and Marco Coleman, who will be back with us. A second author will be joining us, Ron Lippick. He's uh, he's got a book out called Steelers Takeaway: Players' Memoirs Through the Decades. So we'll talk a little bit of Steelers uh, with Ron Lippick when he joins us, and of course, former running uh, Patriots Pro Bowl running back Tony Collins will be back with us to do our five star picks of the week. So we got another great show on tap for you, that, you know, next week. We hope you'll come back and be a part of it with us. Want to remind you, how can you follow us on social media? Well. We've got uh, our Facebook page, Thursday Night Tailgate. Please check us out. Give us a like. That's important to us. Plus, uh, Bob and I both have our own uh, Facebook pages as well. Plus, you can find us on Twitter. I am at CT Mascaro. Bob is at Bob underscore Lazari. And the show is at TNT Podcast. Plus, you can stream or download any of our archive episodes for free, folks, by going on some great podcasting sites like our good friends over at Podbean. They have been so good to us, recommending the show, you know, putting us out there on their banner ads on their mobile app as well over the last few weeks. Can't thank them enough for doing that. You can also stream us you know, on iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Blog Talk Radio, Spreaker, Stitcher, Audio Boom, Player.fm, SoundCloud. We are all over the net. So please, if you've got a favorite app, I'm sure you can find us on it. And if we're not on it, please let us know so we can make sure we get there for you. Bob, take us home, my friend. All right, Chris. You uh, enjoy the rest of the week. And again, thanks to our announcer, Joe Lajanusa, for the great job he does with our weekly intro and ads. And to James Brocato and all the guys from Painted Faces 
for our upcoming outro of music. On behalf of myself and Chris, we thank everyone tonight for listening. We appreciate you all the most. Until next week, good night, Kevin. We miss you. <laughs>